us in prayer. Psalm 57 is where we want to read today. Psalm 57 is where we want to begin reading. If you happen to hear you say amen. For those who are watching online, we're reading from Psalm 57 from the King James Version of the Bible. The Word of God says, David speaking, be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Be over what, everybody? I will cry unto God, most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send me from heaven and shall save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dig, I would say dug, a pit before me. Into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, salt and heart. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Verse 11, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above the earth. Father, bless us now. We've come now in this sanctuary. We've come online, and we need a word from you. So we've sung, we've had a baby dedication, we have prayed, we've read your word, but now we must hear from you. So speak. Lord, give me strength right now. My emotions are heavy. But I pray, God, right now that you would speak through me to speak to your people because somebody today needs a word from you. God, we give you praise in advance for what you're going to do. And at the appeal time, show yourself. Pray this prayer, begging for forgiveness of sin. Let everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Today, I just want to challenge you on the message. Get out of your cave. Get out of your cave. This week has been one of the toughest weeks that I've had in my life. To lose my father has been tough. And then, to be honest, if I can be transparent with you, to lose him so unexpectedly has been tougher. I must admit, I, I have felt down. I have felt distressed. I have felt depressed. And I'm here to tell somebody, depression is real. Depression can take your mind to some places it need not go. So let me be clear, don't laugh at people when they say they're depressed. Don't dismiss people when they say they're depressed. Don't call people crazy when they say they're depressed because depression is real. Now, I've always said it to others, but this week I had to remind myself that one of the most dangerous things to do when you're feeling down, distressed, and depressed is to hang around other people who are down, distressed, and depressed. Do I have a witness to this place now? Because when you're depressed, and other people hanging around you are depressed, everybody's going to be depressed because a depressed spirit can be contagious. For example, in the physical, if you're around sick people long enough, you'll start feeling sick. You can be in a room with somebody who's throwing up, who can't keep anything on their stomach, and all of a sudden, your stomach starts feeling bad. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Somebody can have a cold. And all of a sudden, you start coughing. That's why I understand everybody's worried about coronavirus, because when you're exposed to sickness, you can get sick. Are you hearing what I'm saying, everybody? And just like physical sickness is contagious, spiritual, social, and emotional sickness is also contagious. It's important that you're hanging around people who are positive. I've learned even this week. That's why I came here today. I want to be around some positive people. It's important that you're around people who are positive even when you're mourning because if everybody around you is sick or angry or depressed or miserable, it creates a social system of dysfunction where all of a sudden the normal looks abnormal. If you're around sick people, angry people, miserable people all the time, you will start thinking the entire world is like that. Can I keep it real today? 
It's amazing how somebody can come into a big church like this and not know anyone. But if they were a liar in the old church, they will come in this church and they will find the liars. If they were a gossip in the old church, they can come into this church and find the gossips. And next thing you know, they hook up with the gossips and they're now going to lunch because people like to be around other people who have the same sickness they do. The old saying says that birds, no pun intended, birds of a feather flock together. And so my question for you today is, who are you flocking with? Because when you're a depressed person or a negative person or a miserable person and you run around with depressed people, negative people, or miserable people, you can't shake them because everyone who can say something positive to you is just like you. But you don't need to be around negative people. You can do bad by yourself. <laughs> if you're depressed, you don't need to be around depressed people. If you're negative, you don't need to be around negative people. If you're miserable, you don't need to be around miserable people. As our daughters get older and they get to the point and ready in their lives to live on their own, I'm learning that in the time I have left with them as a parent, that it's not only important that Danielle and myself, that we hang around positive influences, but it's also important that our children hang around positive influences. In fact, I would dare to suggest somebody that it's very important that you orchestrate the people your children admire. That's why for my daughters, this week I was on CNN because I want my black daughters to see Kamala Harris. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want my black daughters to see Justice Katanje Brown Jackson. And let the record reflect today if you're watching. It happened. It happened. For those people that said it wouldn't happen, it happened. And God is still on the throne. Hallelujah. I want my kids to see the bright side of life, not the negative side of life. But the devil and his imps who suffer from pity parties and miserable meetings will say something like, doesn't the Bible teach us to mourn with those who mourn? Bear one another's burdens. And yes, the Bible does say that, but to mourn and be miserable are two different things. Jesus did weep for Lazarus. He did mourn for Lazarus, but he didn't become helpless. Why? He said, I am, despite his tears. I am the resurrection and the life. Despite my tears this week, I know in whom I believe. I know that my Redeemer lived. I know that Jesus is coming back. I know that one day the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we went to our live remains to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let me tell you something, Berean, today. Even the most spiritual people in the world will face trouble. Even the saints will experience pain. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Bad things happen to good people. Don't you believe all this prosperity preaching you see on TV? Five ways to get this. Seven ways to get that. Yes, God wants us to prosper and do well according to 3 John 2, but God also says in John 16, that in this world you will have tribulation, which means you're going to have some trials. You're going to have some tests. You're going to have some tribulation, but you will overcome. Hallelujah. A lot of folk have quit the church and quit Jesus thinking every day we're going to be cancer free and crisis free and COVID free and burden free and trial free. And when it doesn't happen, they get mad. But you better think again. You've got to go through some fire to come out as pure gold because it's after I've been beaten, after I've been bruised, after I've been battered, after I've been talked about, after I've been criticized. That's when I really know how to praise the Lord. That's when I really know how to worship God. That's when I know how to testify because you can't have a testimony without a test. I wish I had a witness in this place. The contents of our scripture in Psalm 57 is rooted in 1 Samuel 17 through 22, which means this psalm is rooted earlier in 1 Samuel. In the text, David is hiding in a cave from Saul. 
Why is David hiding in a cave? The Bible teaches Saul was jealous of David because Saul knew David had been anointed to replace him as the next king. You know the story, David, a little shepherd boy, takes out the gladiating soldier with a small rock and a sling. After defeating Goliath, David becomes well known for his military prowess. As a result, Saul gets jealous. Saul becomes angry because David is getting high praise from the women who sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. 1 Samuel 18 says that Saul eyed David from that time on, and he kept trying to kill him from that time on. In fact, even though David was Saul's son, Jonathan's best friend, Saul sent David out in battle multiple times in order that David might be killed, but it didn't happen. Saul even, read the story, offered his daughter's hand to David in marriage if he brought him 100 Philistine foreskins. Saul did this thinking David would be killed in the process of getting the Philistine foreskins. But not only was David not killed, but the Bible says David returned not with 100 foreskins. But the Bible said he came back with 200 foreskins. Let that be a lesson for somebody who's watching and listening right now. When the Lord has his hand on you, thank you, Jesus. When the Lord has his hand on you, no devil in hell can stop God's hand on you. I'm a witness that when God's hand is on you, people can plot against you all they want, but no devil in hell can stop God's plans for your life. A Red Sea couldn't stop God. A fiery furnace couldn't stop God. Lions in a lion's den could not stop God. I came to let somebody know and to preach it to myself today that the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. The Bible is clear that David had been chosen by God. David had been blessed by God. And when God blesses you, no devil in hell can curse you. When you read the word of God in 1 Samuel 18, and you read the final verses of that chapter, it ends by saying, then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle. As often as they went forth, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Verse 29 of 1 Samuel 18 says, and Saul was yet the more afraid of David. Saul became David's enemy continually. I like the way the New International Version puts it. It says it this way. It says that David remained Saul's enemy the rest of his days. Saul was jealous of David. And because he was jealous of David, he was afraid of David. But let me put a kickstand right here, a preaching kickstand, if you will, and make sure you know what jealousy is. Jealousy is wishing you had what somebody else has. But worse is envy, because envy is wishing they didn't have it at all. Envy is rejoicing over the misfortunes of failures of somebody else. Envy is the spark that started hell's fire. Envy produces the crimes of passion where the rejected lover kills with the thought, if I can't have them, then no one else can. Envy is generally associated with a green-eyed monster. This demon is so strong in those it possesses that it controls their words and actions. Jealousy and envy can wreck the love between two people who thought they were inseparable. Jealousy and envy can bring nations to war and the most powerful people to ruin. That's why I believe Putin is going to get his. Jealousy and envy can make you do some mean, ugly things. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Let me bowl down your alley. I'm talking about the jealousy over a rival who got the job or position or in my line of work got the church you wanted. The jealousy they feel because you live in a better house, drive a better car, or have more money than you do. The jealousy you feel because in your mind she got preferential treatment over you due to the color of her skin, her hair length, or her age. The jealousy in the church that you feel because he or she got the solo and you didn't. The jealousy in the church you feel because they got on the praise team and you didn't. They got the church position that you ain't getting paid for anyway, and you didn't. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. I did pastor this church. Do I have a witness in this place? You know what I'm talking about because too, too often, many times, we have been stung, hurt, betrayed, or devastated by jealousy that we felt in our hearts that it was so strong that its grip made us say some things and do some things that we knew were wrong. We discredit people, we'll talk about people, we'll lie on people and make things up on people because we're jealous of people. 
But in the name of Jesus, I got to tell folk now, you know, I'm getting older. I'll be 50, I told you. That's when my hair is shorter. Come on, say amen. I can't let you see the gray. I tell folk, envy me. Hate on me. Rates me. But the bottom line is, you ain't me. Because what God has for me, it is for me. And let me throw this in. One of the worst features of jealousy is that it often most strikes the people we're closest to. People we know well, people we work with on a daily basis who end up being the source of our jealousy. Think about this story. David was Saul's son's best friend. Saul's daughter loved David. Cain was Abel's brother. The stranger or the outsider who may make us feel jealous comes and goes, but the family member, the friend, the co-worker, the one who's there day by day, month by month, but people who can't stand to see the success of others will never experience their own. Instead of building up Israel, Saul wasted most of his time chasing David through the hills. And it's in Psalm 57 that David escapes from Saul and he's hiding from Saul in a cave, the cave of Adullam. Now, when David's brothers and his father hear that David is hiding and they find out where he is, that he's in a cave, the Bible says that 400 of them go to be with him. The Bible says that everyone who joined David was in debt and bitter of soul, meaning everybody was down. Everybody was distressed. Everybody was depressed. And out of the 400 men who joined David in this cave, not one of them brought him comfort. They were all in a cave. Not just a literal cave, but they were in a figurative cave. And let's not be too hard on them because all of us at one time or another in our lives have been in a cave. A cave, it's a type of dark hour, a struggle, or a serious valley you're facing. A cave is the loss of a loved one. A cave is being fired from your job. A cave is being on a job wishing you had a different job. A cave is being diagnosed with cancer. A cave is being sick and you just feel you will never get well. A cave is going through a divorce. A cave is you're single and you're lonely and you want to be married. A cave is you've lost your boyfriend. A cave is you've lost your girlfriend. A cave is you're sinking deeply in debt. A cave is your lights are off. A cave is you're going through foreclosure. A cave is you're bankrupt. A cave is you're fighting a habit you can't seem to break. A cave is your children have left the Lord, left the church, and don't seem to be coming back. All of us in this place have a cave. And if you don't grab one, keep living. Keep living and you'll get one. The Bible says these men are in a cave, but the good news is this. No matter what cave you're in, I serve a God who can bring you out. The cave is not meant to last forever. It's just a season in your life. Just like it was a season in David's life. What am I talking about? The men are in the cave and the men are looking to David to help them. And David has to come up with a solution to get out of this literal and figurative cave. So David begins to recite our song. And he recites our song, verse number one, be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Now look at the text again. Look at the text again. Let the text speak for itself. The last part of the text says, until these calamities be overpassed. Everybody say overpassed. In other words, the New Day International Version says, until the disaster has passed. In other words, the calamities, the trouble, the cave has not come to last. This too shall pass. I come to remind someone today. I've come to tell myself today that the cave in your life has not come to last. When you are a child of God, trouble does come to an end. 
When you are a child of God, even if it's just in that great getting up day, troubles don't last always. When you are a child of the Most High God, weeping may endure for a night, but joy does come in the morning time. David said he'd take refuge in God's wings. Refuge means shelter or protection from danger. God made, David made God his refuge. He made God his shelter, his protection until these calamities be overpassed, be passed over, be done with. In other words, David is saying to God, God, have mercy onto me until these calamities have overpassed me. God, cover me until these calamities overpass me. Stand with me until these calamities overpass me. In the name of Jesus, I came to tell myself today that the storm is passing over. And God didn't bring you this far to leave you. Wherever you are in your life, God wouldn't take you to it unless he was God enough to bring you through it. Point number one today, get out of your cave because the cave doesn't last forever. But now there's another lesson in the text. Verse 2 of Psalm 57 brings out the second thing we ought to do when we're in our cave. David said, cry unto God the Most High. Sometimes when you're in your cave, in order to get out of your cave, you've got to cry out to God. I'm reminded of Peter when Peter was walking on the water. And Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. The Bible says, not that he sank, but the Bible says, beginning to sink. He cried out unto the Lord, Lord, save me. That was his prayer. Three simple words. Lord, save me. Which reminds me, it's not the length of your prayer, but it's the strength of your prayer. Some people think you've got to pray these long, big words, sermonized prayers to get God's attention. But when you're about to lose your mind, when you are between a rock and a hard place, when you're between a stop sign and an oncoming car, all you have time for is, Lord, save me. All you have time to do is cry out to God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anybody ever cried out to God? I know you came in the Berean and we have this high worship and all this good stuff, but it got time for prayer time and you just began to cry out unto God. You're not worried about how you look. You're not worried about what people think. You're not worried about what people say. You just need to get up out of your cave and you're trying to cry out unto God. Is there anybody know what I'm talking about today? Listen, somebody should have been dead in their grave. Somebody right now should be in bankruptcy court. Somebody had COVID and you shouldn't have come out. Somebody else didn't come out, but for whatever God's reason, he brought you out. Somebody should be in criminal court, juvenile court, divorce court. Somebody should have been out, strung out somewhere, but you cried out unto the Lord. You knew the source of your strength. You knew the strength of your life. And you must remember the source of all your help. Your help doesn't come from money. Your help doesn't come from lottery tickets. Your help doesn't come from your education. Your help doesn't come from your good looks. But your help comes from the Lord. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but I will trust in the Lord my God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I once was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsake nor his seed begging bread. You've got to trust him and believe him, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God that's a salvation. Some of y'all don't get it, that's all right, but let me put it this way. The story is told of a woman who showed up at church, and when she showed up at church, she prayed the same simple prayer every time. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Week after week, she would come to prayer meeting. She would pray that same prayer. Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. The children at the church would start laughing at this woman because every time she opened her mouth, she would cry out and say, Oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Finally, somebody had the nerve to ask the sister, Why do you keep praying that same prayer? 
She said, well, you see, when I cry out to the Lord, I'm just combining the only two prayers I know. She said, you see, I live in a bad neighborhood. And some nights in my neighborhood, there are bullets that are flying. And I have to grab my little daughter. And we have to get on the floor underneath the bed. And in that desperate state, all I know how to do, she said, was to cry out and say, oh, Lord. She said, but when I wake up in the morning and I see that me and my baby are okay, all I can say is thank you, Jesus. When I take my baby to the bus stop every morning and she gets on that bus every morning at 8 o'clock, while she's away, I cry out, oh, Lord. But she says, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, when I hear that bus coming back on my street and the bus arrives at my house and I see that my baby is safe, all I can say is, thank you, Jesus. She said, those are the only two prayers I know. And so when I get to church and I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, all I can do is put my two prayers together and cry out and say, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. And in the midst of your cave, you've got to do what I had to do this week. You've got to cry out and say, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. But not only that, in your cave. Number three, I had to tell myself this week when I was reading the text, you've got to learn how to expect victory. Verse three says, he shall sin from heaven and save me from the reproach of them. The reproach of them that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Let me say this to you all. David expected God to deliver him. Oh, sister, tell us where it got that. Nobody else got that. I said, David expected God to deliver him. He expected victory. Can I tell you something today? We get what we expect from the Lord. I said, we get what we expect from the Lord. If we expect victory, we'll get victory. If we expect defeat, we'll get defeat. David expected victory over his cave. And if you're going to be delivered from your cave and get up out of your cave, you got to learn how to expect deliverance from your cave. When you fall on your knees and pray, let's be real, you all. Are we doing it out of form or fashion? Or do we expect deliverance? I don't know about you, but I'm looking for a miracle. I'm expecting the impossible. I see the invisible. I feel the intangible. You've got to expect deliverance. As a drought, a rain drought, continued for what seemed to be an eternity, a small country community of farmers was in a quandary as to what to do. Rain was important for them to keep their crops healthy and to sustain their way of life. But the problem became more severe. And so the local pastor in that country city, that country town, called for a prayer meeting because he knew that some things only come by prayer and fasting. I wish I had a witness in this place. Many people in that little town came, not just members, but community folk from that country town. The pastor greeted them as they came into the church. After he greeted them, and as he began to walk towards the front of the church to begin the prayer meeting, he noticed that most of the people who had come to the prayer meeting were talking. They were chatting and socializing with friends. When he reached the front of the church, his thoughts were on quieting the people and starting the prayer meeting. His eyes scanned the audience as he asked for quiet. He then noticed a 10-year-old girl sitting quietly in the front row. Her face was beaming with much excitement. Why? Next to her and ready for use was a bright red umbrella. The little girl's innocence and beauty made the pastor smile 
as he realized how much faith she possessed. Why? Nobody else in the church brought an umbrella. All the people came to pray for rain, but the little girl was the only one who was expecting God to answer. I wish I had a church in this place. You got to expect deliverance. Ask, and it shall be given. See, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That whatever we ask, we know we have. You've got to expect deliverance. When we pray in this church, when we come down to the altar, when we fall on our knees, we've got to expect deliverance. David knew, and David was willing to believe that God would deliver him out of the cave. David did admit, read the story, that he was a little discouraged. He says in verse 6 that his soul was bowed down because his enemies had prepared a net for his feet and dug a pit for him. We read it. But in the midst of the pit, guess what happened? The Bible says they fell in it themselves. Don't you forget, friends of mine, that when God is on your side, people can dig ditches, they can set traps against you, but I read in the word that no weapon formed against you so prosper it won't work. The same ditches that people set for you, the same traps that people set for you, the same gallows that people prepare for you are the same ditches, the same traps, the same gallows that they'll fall in themselves. If you don't believe me, ask Haman. The same gallows that Haman prepared for Mordecai were the very gallows he hung on himself be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. David was fully expecting God to deliver him from that cave. So when you're in your cave, expect victory. I got one more thing. When you're in your cave and you want to get out of your cave, number four, you've got to praise God. You got to praise God for the victory you're expecting, even when you're in the cave. In other words, don't wait till the battle is over. <laughs> Shout now, because in the end, you're going to win. Listen, God never told us that we should only praise him when we come out of the cave. But he says, if you want to truly be victorious, then you got to praise him while you're in the cave. In the cave, David said, David said, verse 7, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. He said, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Now, to praise God in the midst of a cave experience isn't the easiest thing to do. Let's keep it real. It's hard to praise God while you're going through it. But you can't wait to get out of your cave to praise him. You got to praise him in your cave. David said, wake up. Give me my psaltery. Give me my heart. And all of you miserable, distressed folk up in here, get up too and praise God in the midst of your cave. I've been in the pity party, David said, too long. If God wants Saul to kill me, let him get me. If God wants my enemies to defeat me, let them defeat me. But the God I serve, he is not like that. God told me a long time ago, before I got in this cave, 
David said that the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So today, in the name of Jesus, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your circumstance is. I don't know what your cane is. You may be sick. You may have lost a loved one. Your marriage may be in trouble. Your money may be funny. Your change may be strange. Your credit may not be getting it, but I'm here to let somebody know God will pick you up. He will turn you around. He will place your feet on solid ground. So in my cave, I came to Berean today to praise him. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in this sanctuary. Praise him in the permanent of his power. I come to praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. I come to praise him with the sound of the trumpet, the psaltery and the harp, the timbrel and the dance, the string instruments and the organ. I come to praise him upon the loud cymbals, upon the high sounding cymbals. Berean, let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Let me tell you something. God can take a shepherd and make him a king. Only God can make a donkey talk. Only God can make the sun stand still. Only God can make a red sea a dry highway. Only God can shut some lion's mouths. Only God can turn water into wedding pumps. Only God can make a blind man see. Only God can make a deaf man hear. Only God can make a dumb man talk. Only God can raise somebody from the dead. Only God can turn a loser into a winner. Only God can take a negative and make it a positive. Only God can take me out of my cave. I appreciate the cards. I appreciate the text messages. I appreciate the emails. I appreciate the food. But oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Only God can get me up out of this cave. Only God can get you up out of your cave. And if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Your cave experience will pass. These calamities will be overpassed. You got to cry out to God. When you're in your cave, whatever your cave is, you got to cry out to God. And then after you cry out to God, you've got to expect victory. You got to expect it, you all. Not only people don't like that name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Ah, you got to expect it. Can I, can I be real, y'all? This my, is my home. Can I be real? One of the things I struggle with within our faith group, I think when we come down to the altar, we just come out of form and fashion. And some people in other faith traditions that are not ours, they come down to the front, they pray, they lay, lay it on the altar, they fall prostrate, and they believe. They believe that God is going to hear their prayer. They believe that they expect deliverance. We got to get to the point that we expect it. That we believe it according to your faith, so it shall be. And then, even if God says no, you gotta trust Him. And then, number four, don't wait till you get out of the cave to praise Him. Go on and praise Him in the cave. Go on and praise Him for what He's getting ready to do. God and praise him in your cave.
the cave time will pass. You gotta cry out to God, expect deliverance, and then you have to praise him in the cave. Are you wanting to praise him in your cage? I'm in my cave, but I'm a praise. If the devil think he's knocked Carlton Bird down, he better think again. He better think again. He should have killed me when he had a chance. He better think again. Devil, if you can hear me, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for the devil. What happened to my father is not the Lord's doing. It is the devil, and I'm coming for the devil. And though he may slay me, yet will I trust in him, because I know in whom I have believed. So praise your way through that game. Come on, let's praise him. You know that song, everybody? Come on now. Him. Praise him. His name is Jesus. 
believe this. But I thank you for reminding me that our calamities will be overpassed. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder that we can cry out to you. God, our crying out to be, oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Lord, today we expect deliverance. In my cave experience, I expect deliverance. There's someone else, Lord, who's in a cave experience right now, and they are expecting deliverance. And because we know you're going to deliver us, we're not going to wait until we get out of the cave to praise you. But even in the cave, my heart is fixed. And Lord, I'm going to praise you. There's someone else today, God, who's in a cave, but their heart is fixed. And they're going to praise you. So, Father, forgive me my sins right now. It's time to close. But, Lord, before we close, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, there's a girl in this physical space, in this sanctuary. And then there's somebody, Lord, in the digital space. And they're in a cave. Father, my cave is I lost my father, but somebody else has another cave. And their cave is different than my cave, but they're still in the cave. And God, they're, they're realizing that the cave doesn't last forever. They realize that, but Lord, they're crying out to you. Maybe not audibly, but maybe silently, maybe in their heart, they're crying out to you. They need deliverance from their cave, and so because they need deliverance, they want to expect deliverance. And then they're going to praise you, not when they get out, but while they're going through. Because they're going through, anticipating you to take them to. So Lord, do it for that individual today. But Lord, today they need to acknowledge, like me, that they are in a cave experience, and they've got to get out of their cave. So Father, in the stillness of this moment here in the Berean Church, watching online, I want to give individuals to join me and say, Pastor Burr, Dr. Jack, I got to get out of this cave. I've been miserable in this pity party for too long. The devil's been whooping me and whooping me, but I got to get out of this thing. They're saying, God, that they weren't created to live and be and remain in the cave. So God, we're going to allow them to ease out of their seat. I know it's COVID and they're going to ease out of their seat. But Lord, even in socially distancing, distancing, they're going to come to the front today because this is a sacred moment. And they're going to come to the front and they're going to spread out in the front. And God, I'm just going to touch them on their shoulder. And as I touch them, Lord, I want you to touch them and touch their situation. That they may have the will to get out of the cave, understanding the calamities will pass. And they got to cry out to you and expect deliverance and praise their way through it. And so, Lord, forgive me of my sins because I pause in this prayer right now. That's appeal number one. Today, you're in a cave. I don't need to know what your cave is, but you're in a cave. And you need not be embarrassed or ashamed because you're in a cave. Because the truth is, all of us are in a cave today. It might be the cave of a family, a marriage gone bad, a relationship with a sibling. A situation with your child, your grandchild. Maybe they've run from the Lord and they, they, they haven't returned and they're in a cave, they don't know it, but you're in a cave because they're in a cave and you're saying, Lord, deliver me today. Deliver my child, deliver my grandchild. Maybe that's you, I don't know what your cave is, but today you're saying, God, help me, get me out of this cave. I want you to come to the front right now. That's appeal number one. I, I, I want out of this cave. God, deliver me. I'm expecting it, I'm believing you for it. Get me out of this cave. I don't know who you are, I don't know what you're dealing with, but you're in a cave today. Come with your mask, leave your mask home, but leave spaced out, because by your coming, you're saying, Lord, I'm acknowledging I got a problem. God, I'm in a cave, I've done all I can do, I'm in a cave today. Like Pastor Bird, I'm in a cave, and the devil is trying to tear me up. In an habit, in addiction, 
You're saying, Lord, deliver me. Deliver me. God, I give you everything that I am, everything that I'm not. But I give myself to you. Lord, I'm weeping. I pray. I haven't told anyone else what I'm going through, but there's something internally that's going on. It's producing a civil war inside. God, deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver my children. Deliver my grandchildren. Get us out of this cave. I came to let you know today as you come, God sees, God records. God is recording right now. Lord, get me out of this thing. That's your prayer today. And by your coming down in faith, I'm here to let you know God is going to reward you. He's going to reward you that you had the courage to stop what you were doing. Forget what people say. Forget what they're going to do. You can't worry about that. You're in a cave right now. And if you're not careful, the devil's going to try to keep you in that cave. And so God, right now, he's going to bless you. I'm going to pray a prayer, a blessing on your life. That's appeal number one. Appeal number two, there's a man, there's a woman, there's a boy, there's a girl. You want to give your life to the Lord Jesus today. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ today. You may have done it before and you say, oh, I wasn't really serious about that, but today I got to give my life to the Lord. I see what's happening in our world. And I realize that my love for Jesus it's the only thing that's going to pull me through because see, when you love the Lord, you obey the Lord. When you love the Lord, you seek to do God's will and, and you say, I love the Lord and I've got to be saved when he comes and I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ today. So today you're here. You may be already down here. You may be down front. You may be watching online and you're saying, I need baptism. I need to be rebaptized. I need special prayer. I need rededication of my life. Today, if that's you, I want you to join us down front today. And I want you to join us down front. I just want you to lift your hand. You may be down front already and you're saying, I need baptism. I need free baptism. I need rededication of my life. Just lift your hand. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. There's someone else today. The cave will be overpassed. The cave will be overpassed. Cry out to the Lord. Expect deliverance. Expect it. And when you expect it, walk like it and talk like it and act like it. I serve a God who can do exceeding abundantly and above all I could ever ask him be. You've got to expect it. He is CEO of the universe. You didn't vote him in. You can't vote him out. You can't impeach him. He's not going to resign. He's God. He spoke something out of nothing. Don't you believe he can deliver you? Expect it. Then you got to praise your way out of it. So I'm going to close. Pastor Jack, come on, doctor. Come to the pastor of the church. And as he's coming, it's, it's not too late. Those who are watching, put in the chat. Put a post. I want baptism. I want rebaptism. I want Bible study. I want rededication. This thing is winding up. You've been in the cave too long. It's time to get up out of your cave. God never intended for you to stay there. For those who yet, you're here. Bow for the main floor, wherever you are. It's too, not too late to get in the ark of safety. It's not too late to come down front. It's not too late to show the Lord and to tell the Lord. This is your way of telling him, God, I'm in a cave and I need you. I need you. It's not too late. It's not too late. So even as Dr. Jack prays, it's not too late. Come on, I'll come get you. I'll come get you. It's not too late. I don't know the next time but I'll see you again. It's not too late. Last Tuesday, I never would have thought I would have received the call from my mother, but my daddy has died. It's not too late while you yet have breath in your body. While you yet have the faculties of your mind. Blood flowing. It's not too late. Father in heaven, we rejoice in your presence today. 
We know that what we've just heard, seen, and felt was the move of your spirit. We thank you for blessing Pastor Bird and his family to be with us today, Lord, and for him stepping out of the way so that your spirit can speak through him in such a clear and powerful way. And as a result of our being here today, Lord, we know that lives have already been changed. Directions have been changed. Destiny and destinations have been changed. Determination and dedication and devotion has set in to the hearts and minds of so many. Those presents and those worshiping with us online. But Lord, whatever you have said to us in our own way, in our own caves today, we are leaving here, Lord, expecting a move of your spirit in our lives. And for this, we say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. So bless Pastor Bird today and especially on tomorrow man through whom you gave him life, the man who modeled and showed him what a pastor, a minister ought to be. Now he has to say those words. He has to be the one to preside and to proclaim. Lord, he is expecting you to show up on tomorrow as you did today. And we say amen, hallelujah, we thank you in advance. Bless those who made decisions, commitments today. Seal their decision for time and eternity. Help them not to turn around, to look back, or to go back, but to put themselves in your hands. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you. In Jesus' name and God's people.